Right. So part two of this, uh, this question here, guys. Okay. A uh, couple of things that unfortunately you would need to know to do this question. Uh, and that, that first thing is this W uh, to V. That means weight to volume or mass to volume of glucose. However, you need to know that the volume in this case is 100 mil. That's a standard unit for W um, over V. So 15% would be 15 grams per 100 mil. But over here, we're dealing in liters. So that would then be 10 times that, 150 grams per liter. That's nasty. That's really nasty. That's, that's very naughty, I think, of QCAA. I don't know how many people would know the WV uh, concentration units. I certainly don't make a fuss about it when I'm teaching my class. So if you didn't know that, then that's something I would say would be very easily excused. And if you put 15 there instead of 150, I would imagine you would lose one of the three marks. They would carry your your mistake through, so you would still get two out of three if you got the rest of it right. Anyway, the 150 there is the 15% W by V of glucose. Now then, if you want to put that in moles, then you've got to divide by glucose's molar mass. C6H12O6 is 180.18. So the moles of glucose is that. If you then write an equation for the fermentation, and to be honest with you, I think that should be there and that should get an extra mark because in the fermentation reaction, glucose C6H12O6 gives two molecules of ethanol and two molecules of CO2. Now that obviously is needed to then get this next line, moles of ethanol is double what you just worked out to be 1.67. The mass then is worked out by simply multiplying the moles by the molar mass of ethanol, which is simply 46.08. That gives you the mass of ethanol, 76.72. Okay, now that would be the theoretical yield if it was 100% converted. However, our particular one was making 37.5, so we put our 37.5 over our 76.72 to give us a 48.9% yield. I thought that was a nasty question, guys. I'm sure you'll agree with me as well. Uh, again, answer goes in the box, okay? Uh, I know I keep saying this, but obviously I just simply pasted the answer from the QCA marking guide, and that meant it didn't show it in the box. Question five, one step in the electrolytic refining of copper uses impure copper anodes and high purity copper cathodes in an electrolyte solution of copper two sulfate. Predict whether the concentration of the copper two sulfate solution will change during the purification process and provide appropriate half equations to support your reasoning. This is not strictly syllabus. It's one of those, um, where QCAA keep it very close to their chest. I personally don't think this is syllabus. I think they should only be looking at it with carbon electrodes. However, if copper electrodes are used, and I teach this to mine just in case, and it's a good job I did because obviously they asked this question. Anyway, if you're using copper electrodes, the reactions at the anode and cathode both involve copper and copper ions. In fact, one is the exact reverse of the other. So effectively, at the cathode, copper will be produced. And that means the copper ions in solution gain electrons to become copper metal. But at the anode, the copper rod, the copper actually, the metal, turns into copper ions. So it's the exact reverse of the cathode reaction. What that means is for every copper ion that is obviously deposited as copper on the cathode, it's replaced by the anode turning into copper ions. So effectively, the copper, copper 2 sulfate concentration doesn't change. If the copper anodes contain silver and zinc impurities, and they often do, and they often contain things like gold as well, and that is something we also obviously get from this reaction, 
determine whether either metal could be produced as a byproduct of this refining process. Explain your reasoning. Okay, so effectively, silver is below copper in the reactivity series. All right, what that means is effectively, they're not going to go into solution. Um, the ions will not be oxidized and they'll be found in the sludge. All right, so silver effectively will be present in the sludge, which collects at the bottom of the electrolytic cell. Uh, zinc, on the other hand, obviously, zinc is a more reactive metal. So this will form ions at the anode and go into solution. However, they are probably going to be in very, very low concentration. So the chances of them discharging at the cathode is pretty much zero. Is that it? Oh, one more question by the looks of it. Polypeptides and proteins are formed by the condensation reactions of amino acids. Identify the type of bond that's formed when three amino acids are joined to form a tripeptide and state any other products formed. Well, hopefully you know that when amino acids join together, they form a peptide bond. I think they might accept amide bond as well there. I don't know. Uh, you might want to check the marking guide in QCAA, but I would have accepted amide bond as well. Uh, it's a condensation reaction, of course, so water is also produced. The total number of tripeptides that could be formed from three different amino acids uh, use their three-letter symbols and describe two of the tripeptides. Uh, well, effectively, you can get six in total because effectively the order in a peptide is, is important. It's not the case of, um, you know, like you can turn it around because one end is a COOH and one end is an NH2, and therefore the order is very important. So you could have histidine followed by lysine and glycine. You could have histidine followed by glycine and lysine. You could have lysine followed by histidine and glycine. You could have lysine followed by glycine and histidine. I think you get the idea. Okay, so six tripeptides and any two examples. Um, how does the pH of a buffer solution used to separate histidine, lysine, and glycine? This is electrophoresis. You may remember this. It came on the end of chrom chromatography. Uh, what I've done for your convenience is put from the data book the three different amino acids. You will see that they have pKa values of 7.6. Um, these are called isoelectric points, by the way. Uh, 7.6, 6.1, and 9.7. Now, the buffer, um, it's, we are told, is, uh, let's have a look, is 7.6. Were we told that earlier? No, we told it now. Okay, so the buffer solution is 7.6. Um, histidine, therefore, will stay put. Because it's got exactly the same pH um, uh, as its isoelectric point, it effectively will stay neutral. Now, electrophoresis, as you probably remember, has a positive end and a negative end, two electrodes, and therefore, obviously, will attract uh, any ion of opposite charge. Well, since the um, buffer is the same pH as the isoelectric point of histidine, it will remain neutral and therefore it will stay put. Isoelectric point of glycine is six. What that means is glycine is effectively acidic to the buffer. Therefore, glycine will give up this proton here to the buffer solution and therefore create a negative ion. And that negative ion will therefore travel towards the positive electrode, the anode. Uh, lysine, on the other hand, as you can see, has an isoelectric point of 9.7. So lysine is basic compared to the buffer. So now then the buffer will give a hydrogen ion, a proton, to lysine. This NH2 will become NH3+. Plus, and therefore this whole thing will become positive and travel to the negative electrode, the cathode. And that, I think, is it. Yeah, good. Good luck, guys. Hope everything goes well.